Today is another installment of my on again, off again sermon series, Lies My Pastor Told Me, this time Christian Values. Um, so here's the thing when you dive into these texts, at first glance, they are like nonsense, unrelated, sort of random stories, right? When you dive into them, you find that there is a through line through all of these. It all starts off with that last line of the gospel lesson, where he says, you are witnesses of this resurrection. Okay, that's not just to those apostles in that time. That's to all Christians everywhere, right? Whether or not you're talking literally, in the case of the apostles, a witness to the resurrection, or all of us, because by faith we know of the resurrection, right? That we are to go be witnesses, But later on, in those other two ones, which we actually read first, it reminds us that when you go out and you are a true witness to the resurrection, as you truly should be, the world will look at you as a fool. The world will not just look at you as a fool, the world will not understand what you're trying to get at or why. And for that, they may very well hate you. In fact, they probably will. But take heart. They hated me. They hate you. It's okay. Now, that is how all those sermons I'm going to to pick on also start out. And up to that point, they're doing good, right? That's all very true. The problem comes next, because they're going to go in one of three directions. But they're all three directions make the same mistake. The next thing you'll hear, and tell me if you've ever heard sermons like this, the next thing you're going to hear is then to say, there are Christian values. That's why the world hates you. You have world values, Christian values. They clash not totally wrong. And then you're either going to talk about politics next. You all probably heard that sermon. Or if you're not talking about politics, you'll talk about something in the land of like how you should worship. The proper way to worship, which the world will not understand is, and there'll be a list, right? We all remember those, if you're old enough, you remember the little acolyting books from the 1970s and 80s, which all told you the right way to light a candle, the right order to light those candles, and they all disagree with each other. If you put them next to each other, I've done this game. Or they're going to tell you the right thing to buy. Now, that's not as normal in us mainline world, but if you ever go to a non-denominational church, they will probably have a gift shop in the back, and they will sell you the right things you should buy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Either way, no matter which way that sermon goes, they miss the entire point. Because the entire point is not about a policy position or about a liturgical or theological position. It's not about buying the right thing. What Jesus is talking about is not the specific. He's talking about the general. Let me explain. We'll start with the politics one because it's easiest to understand this one. We've all sat in that sermon where you start here and then you move either to the left or you move to the right and then you get told that these positions are the positions that Christians hold and these positions are the positions that non-Christians hold, right? This could come from the right, this could come from the left. I've sat through both versions. And I say they're both wrong. The reason they're both wrong is they're talking about positions, not priorities. Quick political science 101 class. I have a degree in political science. That's my original background. Uh, There's a difference between like a policy position, like I believe X on such issue, right? And how much I care about it. Because if you poll Americans, you'll find that they have all sorts of opinions about all sorts of things, right? But that doesn't actually help you know how they're going to vote because there are certain things we all care about a lot more than other things, right? We all probably have an opinion about our diplomatic relationship with France. Doesn't mean we're going to care about that at the end of the day because there's probably things we care about more, right? That's interesting policy and priority. I bring that up because I don't think God is talking about policies. If the Bible was talking about policies, the Bible would give us specific policies. It generally doesn't. What the Bible does do is talk about thing, certain things a lot and other things very little. For example, the Bible talks about the poor more than a thousand times. You're in the same zone if you're talking about people who are oppressed. You're in the same zone if you're talking about people who are hungry or people who are naked or people who are in prison or, or any number of things like that. That's what the Bible talks about. That's the priorities for Jesus. It's the priorities for the prophets. It's the priorities for the Bible. Not that they don't talk about other things. They do, but to a much lesser degree. So perhaps the problem is 
we don't talk about the things or deeply care about the things that the Bible cares about. Not in the policy position of should you take the Republican position or the Democrat position, but rather what would the world look like if everyone's top position, whether or not their answer was a conservative or liberal or libertarian or populist answer, regardless of their answer, if their top concern of everyone was poverty. If the thing we held people accountable for was how they treated the naked or the homeless or the oppressed. Like, you could have a Republican or conservative answer. You could have a liberal or democratic answer. But if this was the number one thing people cared about, we'd live in a really different world, wouldn't we? Without having to get into the world of partisanship or the world of policymaking, if it was truly what we cared about, politics would be really different. We'd have very different fights and very different outcomes. But I don't think it's just with politics, right? Sometimes the pastors will go down this road where they'll talk about the right way to worship or the right sort of cultural way to be a church person. You should dress in a suit and tie, dang it. Or you shouldn't be stuffy and dressed in a suit and tie. But you know what the greatest of all the arguments that are just sort of what I call cultural, non-political arguments are? It's the great, beautiful, now 40-plus-year argument, contemporary versus traditional. The greatest of all the arguments, right? Which music should we have? And yet both definitions show the problem with the framing. I think God would kick the whole frame out rather than talk about it in that thing. Let me explain why. So, traditional. I'm going to pick on you guys first, but I'm picking on the contemporary right afterwards, so don't worry. Traditional. When you say traditional, what you mean is the way it used to be done. When Christians were Christians, we have this deep musical thing goes back hundreds of years. Yeah. So does mariachi music. So does Zydeco. So does Tejano. Baba Yetu, which is Swahili from the Lutheran Church of Tanzania, is the Lord's Prayer put to music. None of y'all mean any of that when you say traditional, do you? Not one of those should ever be played on an organ. It would butcher the music. When you say traditional, people mean European traditional. I told you, I'd pick on the contemporary next. So if you just felt very uncomfortable, don't worry. I'm going to make you feel very happy for a moment. I'll make everyone else feel very uncomfortable. Okay? So contemporary, folks, I have a word, I have a thing to talk to you about. So contemporary means like the, the, the music the people are listening to, right? That's like the definition. So I, I have bad news to break to you all. So when we say contemporary Christian, we, also, we always mean rock and roll, right? So if you looked at CD sales, and yes, I mean CD sales because back when CDs were actually used was when this happened. Yes, that many years ago. Rock, rock and roll got surplanted by rap R&B, and most of all, hip-hop. Folks, rock and roll's on fourth tier here. Even with all the help that Taylor Swift has given them. And let me tell you, she makes up like most of rock and roll now. R&B, hip-hop, and rap? Absolutely in sales, in amount of music, in the amount of hours listened to, crushes rock and roll now. And yet, when we say contemporary, we ain't meaning getting up here and all rapping. We ain't meaning doing a hip-hop service. We're not talking about doing any of that. Because what we mean is rock and roll, or what we mean is another type of, in this case, white, maybe culturally appropriated, music. So here's your two choices. Which type of music do you want? This type of white music or this type? What does that do? That excludes literally the rest of the globe. Whether or not it's traditional or contemporary, if it's in the rest of the globe, it doesn't have a home in that argument. I think God would reject the entire framing because it rejects most of the people. Now, does that mean that it's bad or wrong? No. But imagine if that debate happened in a completely different frame. Maybe the question isn't, should it be traditional or should it be contemporary, but rather, what meets the needs of this community at this time, in this place, whether or not we're talking to people inside, but also the people outside the church? What sparks people to action? What leads people to do what God wants them to do? What helps people get fulfilled and come back out more filled than when they came in? And for some folks, I will tell you right now, that is an organ. And for some folks, that is a rock band. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But for some folks, it might be R&B. For some folks, it might be rap. For some folks, it might be Zydeco. There's nothing wrong with that either. Imagine if that whole debate occurred in that context. Not trying to figure out what's right, but what puts people's hearts on fire. What moves people to do good. That's a whole different debate than, heck, we've had for 40 years in the churches around the world, right? My favorite one is the economic one. This is a favorite within the non-denominational arena um, because a lot of non-denominationals, if you don't believe me, go find one, have a gift shop in the back. Again, if you don't believe me, go find a big non-denominational church. They will have a gift shop right next to the coffee bar. Okay? And in that gift shop, they're going to sell you Christian clothes and Christian music and Christian this and Christian that so you can live in a Christian bubble where you don't have to interact with all those worldly music and worldly clothes and worldly stuff. And you're going to know it's Christian because there's going to be little, like, three nails on it that makes a cross. And those pants, they're now Christian pants. I'm joking. Though that's actually a thing. You can look it up. Okay? Imagine if we took all that money and all that time that goes to all this Christian stuff, and some of it is really Christian, and they can argue why this is more Christian than the alternative. Okay? Those do exist out there. But imagine if we said, how much does the way this is produced line up with Christian values rather than does it have a scripture verse on it? Because some of that stuff does fairly go ahead and pay their laborers. Some of it really does not. Some of it is accountable for how those pants got produced. Some of it really ain't. Imagine if everything we bought because we were Christian, we cared first and foremost that the laborers got a fair payment. Now again, your ideology, your politics, you might have a different definition of what fair equals, right? There's arguments to be had. I'm not having those arguments. I'm saying if that was your primary concern when you bought pants, not whether or not they're stylish. That would change the economy. If things like sustainability and fair wages, what does it do to your neighbor, whether or not you're talking your neighbor down the street or your neighbor on the other side of the world, those were your biggest concerns when buying something, if that's what made it Christian, we'd have a really different economy. See, I think where those sermons all went wrong is they got stuck in the particular. The particular ideology, the particular brand, the particular way of doing worship, and then whatever they came out of after that was always going to be wrong because it's not what God's talking about. He's not talking about the particular. He's not talking about the picture. He's talking about the frame. He's talking about what makes you Christian, how do you live that out in the world? Not how you can separate yourself from the world. Because aren't we supposed to be witnesses of the resurrection? And if you're a witness, then doesn't that involve going to the world? Not hiding from it? So as you go out today, ask yourself a simple question in your prayer life this week. In what way am I living out my Christian virtues? In what way am I living out my Christian values? And then are those particulars... Or is Christianity framing how I see everything? Amen.